Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. March 11, 1942, on Corregidor, a 62-year-old Army officer with his family secretly slipped away from the Philippines and in a minor miracle made their way down to Australia. Before General MacArthur left the islands, he said, I will return. Two and a half years later, October 20th, 1944, he stood again on the soil of the Philippines and said, this is the voice of freedom. People of the Philippines, I have returned. John Bartlett writes, Now, if you think a man can have that kind of credibility, and if you can appreciate that quality in a man, I'll tell you that Jesus Christ, the God-man, has made this same promise far more credible than any human being will ever be. If you wrestle with the truth of Christ's return, wrestle no longer. If you accept the historic fact of His ascension, then you have no room to doubt his historic yet future return. It will occur. The Apostle Peter encourages his Jewish readers to not doubt the promise of Christ's coming. It is certain. It will occur. When we rightly divide the word of truth, we learn and we know that only the Apostle Paul speaks of Christ's return at the rapture. For the church, the body of Christ, which takes place prior to the seven-year tribulation period. Any mention of a coming of Christ outside of the letters of Paul is a reference to either the first or second coming of Christ to the nation of Israel. Thus, when Peter writes Jewish believers who had been dispersed in 2 Peter, and he refers to the promise of Christ's coming, He's talking about Christ's second coming after the tribulation, not the rapture of the church before it. With that basis of understanding, we'll take a look at these verses and see the one thing that Peter reminds Israel about concerning Christ's second coming. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4 read, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here, Peter prophesied and cautioned his readers about something. He wrote, Knowing this first, this was something of foremost importance for Israel to know. What he wanted Israel to know is that in the future there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Peter prophesied that in the last days scoffers would arise questioning Christ's second coming to this earth. There are two last days to differentiate between in Scripture. The first is the last days of the current age of grace before Christ's return in the air at the rapture. And we learn about that in Paul's epistles. The second last days is the last days for Israel before Christ returned to the earth at His second coming, which we learn about in prophecy, the gospel records, and the Hebrew epistles. The last days Peter refers to here are the days before Christ returned to the earth at His second coming, the latter days of God's program with Israel according to prophecy. Here in 2 Peter 3.3, Peter explained that in the last days for Israel and the early part of the tribulation, scoffers would come along. A scoffer is one who mocks or ridicules. These people poke fun at the faith. They will be hostile to the revelation of God in that day. It's been well said that a scoffer is someone who treats lightly that which ought to be taken seriously. And the Word of God should always be taken seriously. These scoffers will come walking after their own lusts or their own evil desires, Peter says. They will have e evil desires to deceive, 
to deceive for greed, to gain a following. Jude 1.16 also speaks of these people in the tribulation. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, just like what Peter says. In their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. There have always been cynics, scoffers, and mockers of the faith and of the word of God. Today, under grace, we find them as well. But they come and they go. And the word of God stands sure and faithful and unchanging. These scoffers in the future day will have a specific thing in mind that they're going to ridicule. They will brazenly ask, where is the promise of his coming? That is, where is the promise of Christ's second coming to Israel? Not only does the Word of God predict the second coming of Christ, it predicts the appearance of the scoffers who deny the second coming of Christ. Scoffers in the future will mockingly question Christ's faithfulness to His promise and the fulfillment of the promise of the Word of God of Jesus Christ to return to this earth in glory. The promise of Christ's second coming entails judgment and wrath to be poured out against Christ's enemies. So in mocking the promise of his, his coming, these scoffers are mocking the judgment of God that they believe it'll never, ever happen. Their reasoning is, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. To sum up their scoffing in that day, at the beginning of the tribulation, it will be, how in the world can you believe this? You actually think Jesus Christ is coming back? You really believe he's going to intervene in history, come to this world and punish the wicked? It's a pack of nonsense. Everything stays the same. Nothing's changed. Everything is the same as it has been for thousands of years. In that future day, they will say that since the fathers fell asleep, or the ones in the past to whom the promise of Christ's coming was made, who rested all of their hope in it, all things continue since the beginning. Nothing's happened. Their argument against Christ's second coming is based on the philosophy of naturalism, the denial of supernaturalism, and the theory of uniformitarianism. Naturalism is the belief that nothing exists beyond the natural physical world. Instead of any supernatural interventions or spiritual explanations, naturalism focuses on explanations that come from the laws of nature, that there is a natural explanation for everything. Anti-supernaturalism assumes that no spiritual beings, especially God, has or will interrupt the course of human history to make changes either large or small. Uniformitarianism says that all natural phenomena have operated uniformly since the beginning of the earth, that existing processes in nature have always acted in the same manner and with essentially the same intensity as at the present, and that these processes are sufficient to account for all the changes that have taken place. In other words, everything has remained the same or uniform since the beginning. Their beliefs will be that everything in the universe is stable, closed, fixed, and governed by patterns that never vary. Nothing catastrophic has happened in the past, so nothing catastrophic is going to happen in the future. There will be no supernatural intervention of Christ's coming and no supernatural judgment of mankind. And that, of course, is error and false. And knowing people will believe this in the future and will scoff at Christ's coming and the promise of it. Peter wasn't going to allow it to pass without a challenge. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. The Life and Letters of the Apostle Peter is a paperback 248-page commentary written by Pastor Paul M. Sadler. There is very little written on what are commonly called the general epistles from the standpoint of the word, rightly divided. 
This is somewhat understandable to the extent that most of our Grace authors have spent the lion's share of their time addressing falling themes. Of course, this has been by design, since the commands of Christ for the church today are found solely in Paul's epistles. While there will always be room to further our understanding of the mystery, perhaps the time has come to consider the writings of Peter in light of the falling revelation. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. 2 Peter 3, 5-7 reads, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Peter points out what the scoffers will be willingly ignorant of. They will purposely disregard information. It's deliberate ignorance. Peter points out two events that show that God did intervene in the world in the past, the creation and the flood. And today under grace, we have scoffers who are willingly ignorant of these things, who willingly refuse to believe that God created all things out of nothing, and they willingly refuse to believe the worldwide flood. It is not a matter of them having never heard of God creating everything. It is that they come up with all kinds of theories to push the thought and the idea out of their minds. When God spoke by the Word of God, the heavens, the entire universe came into existence. And by the Word of God, the earth stood out of the water and in the water, referring to the land appearing from or out of the water, and God dividing the water from the dry land on the third day of creation. Psalm 33, 9 says, For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The mockers in the future will willfully shut their eyes and close their ears to the biblical record of the creation. The whereby is interesting in verse 6. It's referring to the things in verse 5. Whereby, or by water, and by the word of God, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The earth came into existence by God's Word, and the dry land by water. Peter then showed that he used both means to judge the world and its inhabitants. Speaking of the waters that separated from the dry land in the original creation, Peter speaks of the reversal of that separation by means of the worldwide flood. The world created in Genesis 1 was in the time of Noah destroyed by these same waters and according to the word of God. And those waters covered the entire earth, covering even the highest hills and mountains. It's interesting how often it is the case that those who reject God creating all things also reject the worldwide flood. And so it will be in the future they will be willingly ignorant of it. Peter shows that God exists beyond the natural world, that not everything can be explained from the laws of nature, that everything has not remained the same or uniform since the beginning. There was a catastrophic worldwide event in the past. God intervened supernaturally in this world in a big way by the creation and by the flood. And the purpose of his supernatural intervention at the global flood was to judge and punish the wickedness of mankind. Peter uses this example 
to show that he supernaturally intervened and judged the wickedness of mankind in the past. And having done that, he can and he will do it again in the future. And that's why many reject the flood in Noah's day. Because if they acknowledge that God judged the world as a result of evil in time past, they know that he will judge the wicked deeds of people in the future. And the unbelieving do not want to believe that. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Peter had talked about how the scoffers would be willfully ignorant in Israel's last days. Then he tells his readers, but, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Peter didn't want them to be ignorant of this one thing. He did not want this one truth to escape their notice. And this affects our lives as well, this passage. The one thing that Peter wanted Israel to remember is that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Psalm 90 verses 2 and 4 read, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. It's been said well that to a man of countless riches, a thousand dollars are as a single penny. And that's how time is to our eternal God. God's relationship to time is different from ours. We see time against time. God sees time against eternity. The reason Peter states this is because as far as God's faithfulness to his promises go, it does not matter if he gave his promise yesterday or a thousand years ago. He will still remain faithful and he will fulfill every promise. The passage of a thousand years should never lead anyone to conclude that God will not fulfill what he has promised. The passing of time does not cause God to forget his promises. Since a thousand years are as one day to the Lord in his sight, there is no delayed fulfillment of his promises. A promise he gave 3,000 years ago about the second coming of Christ is only like a few days old to God. He cannot and he will not forget it. But Peter did not say that to God one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years are one day, but rather one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Peter was using a simile. What to people may seem like a long time is to the Lord God very, very short. The point is not that time has no meaning for God, but rather that his use of time is such that we cannot confine him to our time schedules. Edmund, Edmund Hebert writes this, God's use of time is extensive so that he may use a thousand years to do what we might feel should be done in a day, as well as intensive doing in a day what we might feel could only be done in a thousand years. He often waits to work, but once God begins to work, he gets things done just as he has promised in his word. The scoffers will not understand the eternality of God Almighty. Where is the promise of his coming, they will ask suggesting that the long delay in Christ's second coming implies that God doesn't keep his promises. But God is sovereign. God is eternal. God is faithful. Everything will take place just as he has promised in his time. And this one thing touches our lives because we wait for a coming of Christ at the rapture. When we realize that a thousand years is like one day to God, we know that God has not forgotten that promise to us, the body of Christ, either. This dispensation of grace has been going on for nearly 2,000 years, but it's only like a couple days to God. 
God is faithful. He is working his plan, and Christ will return one day. Thus, we should be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior every single day of our lives. Then Peter points out that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Slack means delayed, slow, tardy, late. Peter says that with the promise of Christ's second coming, God is not tardy. God is not late. God is not off schedule, as some people might consider what is late or tardy. In other words, the ones who wonder, where is the promise of his coming? Nobody on earth has the right to decide when God must act or decide that God is late. Mankind might be late or forgetful about their promises, but not God. Everything is perfectly on time according to his will and his purposes. He is faithful to every single promise. The reason God has delayed the second coming of Christ and the day of judgment is because of his long suffering, Peter wrote. And his long suffering, God is not willing that any should perish. He desires that all should come to repentance. He gives lost sinners the opportunity to be saved. Notice the us word in verse 9. The us word in verse 9 is Israel, the Jews. That is who Peter is addressing in writing, dispersed Jews among the nations. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote in Romans 10.1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That was Paul's desire because that is God's heart in God's desire as well. God desires Israel, the Jews, to be saved. God is long-suffering toward Israel, not willing that any of them should perish. But we also learn and know through the Apostle Paul that, as 1 Timothy 2, 4 says, that God desires all to be saved. Every single person in this world he desires to be saved because Christ gave himself a ransom for all and he died for all. 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles. Peter gives a further reason why the promise of Christ's second coming to Israel had not occurred. It's the long-suffering of the Lord toward the Gentiles, or the nations. At the stoning of Stephen, God temporarily set Israel aside in unbelief and suspended his program with her. He then raised up the Apostle Paul, called him to be the Apostle of the Gentiles, revealed to Paul the dispensation of the grace of God. In this dispensation, the Lord is revealing his long-suffering toward all people, he has turned to all, to the world, to both Jew and Gentile, with the gospel of the grace of God, giving all people an opportunity to be saved, offering grace and peace from God the Father and God the Son to all mankind. The reason for the continued delay in Christ's second coming to Israel is due to the dispensation of grace, which, as Paul says, in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. This is a dispensation in which God is showing long-suffering to all and saving people by His grace. The long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, Peter puts it. The long-suffering of our Lord is salvation that is for the Gentiles, is what he's saying. This dispensation is all about the long-suffering of our Lord and the salvation that is available to all nations and all people by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's salvation is the pattern for all in this dispensation of grace. As Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1.16, that in me for first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul was the chief of sinners. His salvation was by the long suffering of Christ. All are saved like Paul in this dispensation by the long-suffering of God and the grace of God, just believing on Christ, the life everlasting. Peter tells us here, here's that 
long suffering in salvation is as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him. That wisdom given unto him is the revelation of the mystery given to him directly by the risen, exalted Lord Jesus Christ. The mystery is Christ's church truth for this dispensation of grace revealed fully in Paul's letters. This truth reveals how we are saved into the church, the body of Christ, how we have a heavenly hope and calling, and how this dispensation will close with the rapture of the church. Peter wanted his Jewish readers to read Paul's writings that they might have a fuller understanding as to why the promises to Israel were temporarily being left unfulfilled. If they read Paul's epistles, they would see and learn about the wonderful work that God is doing among the nations according to his eternal purposes. Today, God is fulfilling his plans and program with the Gentiles. It is this current dispensation of grace, the long-suffering of God in it of saving souls. It is the church, the body of Christ. It is all of these things that is delaying the second coming of Christ to Israel to judge his enemies at the close of the tribulation. The Lord is not slack concerning that promise, though. He will fulfill it. Christ will come again to Israel, but now it, it awaits the close of the dispensation of grace. Once the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and is complete and the rapture takes place, God will turn again to his chosen nation Israel. He will pick up right where he left off on her prophetic timetable. The next thing on that timetable is the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year tribulation. At the close of that tribulation, Christ will come again and to Israel to set up his kingdom on the earth. It's encouraging to know that God is faithful to all his promises and that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. This one thing can transform our lives. God's faithfulness to us, his faithfulness to his word and to all his promises should challenge us to give all of ourselves to Him, to serve Him, to rest in Him, to trust Him more, to live by faith in His faithful Word. When we do this, we gain an even greater appreciation for the faithfulness of God. And by that faithfulness, He can transform our lives. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society. P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.